also to Tengi, who was actually the cause for me coming here. Right. So let's start. Uh, the topic of tonight's talk will be uh, Open ID Connect. Um, how many of you guys do actually know about this protocol? Okay, so quite a number of you actually. Right. But before we um, before we uh, continue with the technical stuff, I'll just do a brief presentation about myself. There's some stuff about me. Right. So what can I say about myself? Uh, I've been married for 15 years. Uh, to Java. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, this year Java will be celebrating its 20th anniversary. Is there anyone here who has been with Java since the very beginning, maybe? Okay, okay excellent. I'm done. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Anyway, but being married uh, to Java for uh, 15 years does not mean that I've been always faithful to this particular language. Actually, uh, I have had a number of affairs. Okay. To start with, um, I've had an affair with C. Uh, back then I was very young, um, and you know when you're a young guy you have a lot of uh, testosterone and basically you think that you can rule the world. Basically I, was, I, was, I have just finished university and back then I thought okay I have all this knowledge and I can build stuff from the ground up. And the best stuff to do that is to uh, use C. Um, okay. Then later on uh, came Python. Which is a fairly elegant language, um, a pre pretty much like its uh, scripting capabilities and all the stuff uh, was um, yeah, pretty, pretty fun to do. Then a couple of years ago, um, I started using JavaScript. Now JavaScript for uh, enthusiasts can be a very nice language. Um, you can do a lot of, um, how to say, uh, beautiful design stuff in, in the browser, run interfaces. But occasionally you have this uh, bad days. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's a mix of that. Right. So let's continue. What, what is uh, OpenID Connect? Uh, so essentially, this is a new internet standard. And um, as a standard, it took um, it took a couple of years to actually publish it because there was initially a working group which which uh, began work working on standardizing what Facebook initially uh, came up with maybe four or five years ago, and this technology was called Facebook Connect, basically a protocol to allow uh, various websites. To authenticate users with their own identity service. And single sign on uh, is one of the main functions of OpenID Connect. And of course, identity provision, which, which, which is closely uh, related. Uh, OpenID Connect is not, the, of course, the first uh, protocol that does this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, years ago, there, there was um, and people realized that it's good to standardize uh, the flow in terms of how you uh, authenticate users. Uh, OpenID 1.0 was such an attempt, and followed uh, OpenID 2. In the corporate world, there was uh, this uh, SAML uh, effort to uh, provide authentication as well. Uh, however, was OpenID uh, Connect does differently is that it offers a much smoother uh, integration for uh, developers. Uh, and particularly, it's very well suited for the modern requirements of mobile um, applications, which the previous protocols uh, do not handle that well. So essentially, uh, OpenID Connect is good for consumer apps, uh, for social applications that is logging with third-party uh, providers such as Google, uh, 
it also has a number of features which make, make it suitable for enterprise. And of course, as I mentioned, mobile applications. Uh, another good thing is that uh, Open Edicone has been backed from the very beginning uh, by the major players, uh, which, which shows, uh, I would like to think about uh, Microsoft because they did quite a lot of effort and one of the top tech guys is actually uh, chairing the group together with Google. And there are also many other implementers uh, and backers in a corporate world such as Salesforce. So if we think about the protocol as a whole, uh, what is its function? Basically, we need to authenticate users and uh, with applications, I mean, you have to do that quite often. Uh, building, a local, uh, building local authentication is something that you can uh, do quite well if you give enough attention to it, but it has a few uh, drawbacks. Number one, if you're running, let's say, uh, a consumer web application somewhere requiring users to enter their credentials in order to, to open up an account with your service can be uh, quite uh, uh, cumbersome and people might just, just leave. And alternatively, if you're running, let's say, uh, if you're responsible for uh, building uh, enterprise applications, uh, you don't want to end up in, into a nightmare situation uh, where you basically have to maintain uh, a whole set of disparate uh, uh, databases for storing the, the end user credentials. So the solution, solution to that is to, uh, to come up with an identity provider. So how does this work? I mean, there are just two steps for that. Number one, whenever you want to authenticate somebody, you just send them to the provider because this is the place where the user will authenticate uh, himself. And this typically happens uh, via the browser, i.e. the user agent, uh, using HTTP 302 in And then once the user is authenticated, what your application gets back is the so-called uh, identity or ID token. So that's basically it. Open ID Connect is still in three points. Right. So what is the ID token? Uh, this is the key Open ID Connect artifact. That's basically the thing that you want to get at the end. Uh, this is a security token which basically asserts uh, the user's identity. Okay. And a very good uh, analogy for that is your uh, identity card we should get from the French government. Okay, this, here in this example we have this student identity card. So the, if you, if, the best way to think about the, uh, the ID token is basically an identity card, which basically says, okay, who the user is. It asserts the user's identity. Uh, in, inside the ID token, this will basically be the user ID. It also specifi specifies uh, the authority that issued the card or token. That is a unique URL for the OpenID provider. It also specif may specify uh, what particular authentication mechanisms were used to identify the user. Let's say, uh, did the user uh, authenticate with username and password? Uh, was some kind of an email confirmation used? or maybe hardware token, etc. Um, in contrast to uh, identity cards, the ID tokens are always generated for a particular client. So they're not just generated like that. Uh, the receiving client is always encoded inside the token. Uh, they do have an expir uh, expiration date. That is, they're not valid forever. Um, they may also contain additional data, uh, such as the user's email, uh, name, other information. But this is now optional. Stuff. And finally, uh, the token is cryptographically uh, secured. This normally happens uh, using an RSA signature. Right. 
So if we take the IC token and decompose it, inspect, inspect it, uh, we'll see that its payload is basically um, a JSON object. And ID tokens issued by um, OpenID Connect, they are specified by the JSON Web Token standard, which is a separate specification and it's used for all kinds of stuff, things like uh, encoding states or um, encoding access tokens. Um, are you guys familiar with this uh, JSON Web Token protocol? Yes. Okay, so there are some, some of you who know about it. Well, basically, uh, for those of you who, um, who uh, hear about it for the first time, this is basically a JSON object which has a number of assertions or claims. Uh, it also has a cryptographic header and the whole structure is then uh, signed. It may be protected, let's say, with an HMAC or you could apply RSA to it. So the token may be verified. Uh, using the provider's public key. Uh, I'll briefly explain what the, what these promises mean. Okay, this member is basically the issuer, that is the URL of the OpenID provider. SUP, this means the user ID or the subject, in this case it's just a string uh, which says Alice. Uh, audience, now inside the audience we encode the um, client identifier. That is the recipient of a token. Uh, we have the expiration, which is specified as a Unix timestamp. Uh, we also have a, uh, an issue date, and we may optionally, optionally uh, include information such as when the token was created and what particular uh, authentication methods and strength it has. Here it basically says that uh, we use password and uh, a hardware token to identify the user. A very important uh, bit about uh, JWT, uh, JSON Web Tokens, is that the, uh, the encoding is URL safe. Uh, this was specifically done uh, to allow um, developers to pass the token as uh, query strings inside URLs. So once we get this information, apply uh, the cryptography to it, we get this, this particular string. Okay. So, what can we do uh, with the ID token? Apart from, um, apart from using it as a mechanism to find out what the identity of the user is. Okay, number one and this is commonly done, you can use it as a method for a simple stateless uh, session management. That means um, you can have sessions, you can use it as a session uh, cookie which you pass in, into the browser and then uh, your backend on, on, on only needs to verify the RSA signature to find out whether the session is due valid or not. If the session has expired, you just make another request to the OpenID Connect server to get a new token. So this saves you the effort uh, to store sessions in memory or in disk, let's say in your data space or in some kind of a cache. Right, what else can you do? Um, you, can, you may also pass the, to the ID token to third parties in, let's say, as, as part of a web service call to basically uh, assert who the user is. Uh, another possible use is to exchange the ID to token for an access token. And this commonly uh, happens in uh, more complex or enterprise applications. Uh, I'll give you a, a brief example, we will analogy how, how this may work. Let's say the other day I arrived in Paris, I checked at the hotel, and the lady at the reception asked me for my ID card. Yeah. And once she verified my ID card and that I am Vladimir, she then gave, gave me the access token for the, for, for the room, so I can get into my room. <coughs> so this is, I think, a good analogy. Okay, so now we come to uh, this 
B, which is how, how do we obtain the ID token. Uh, I, was, I was trying to postpone this bit for as long as possible. <laughs> Basically, we use OAuth 2.0 um, protocol flows to uh, obtain the ID token. Uh, for people who uh, open up the uh, OAuth uh, specification and start reading, um, start reading the spec, they might be a bit confused. Uh, because they're, they're, uh, you have these various flows, you have the implicit flow, so-called implicit flow, then you have the so-called call flow, um, then you have this plan secret, and your plan has to authenticate some kind of a token endpoint. Yeah. So what I'll do, I'll basically try to um, digest this stuff to you and hopefully be able to present it in a, in a slightly simpler way. Um, in OpenID Connect, there are basically uh, three flows or pathways, steps that you take to get uh, the ID token. Uh, the most commonly flow that is used by applications is the so-called authorization code flow. And it works for typical web and mobile apps. Uh, another nice feature of it is that the client gets authenticated. That is, your application has to authenticate to the provider before it can obtain the tokens. And the actual tokens are retrieved via a back channel request. Uh, then we also have the so-called implicit flow, uh, which is purely intended for um, JavaScript applications that run in, in the browser. That means you don't have any uh, real server backend that can make back channel requests or store state. Uh, in this particular state, a flow, the client is not authenticated. That is, uh, you, you, you may retrieve the token without passing um, any authentication for the app. For the app. Uh, and the actual tokens are re returned by the front, front channel. That is, they are included uh, in the browser redirection uh, parameters. Then finally, um, OpenID Connect has come up with the so-called hybrid flow, which is uh, very rarely used. And uh, it was intended for applications that are split into front-end and back-end. Let's say you have a JavaScript front-end that renders um, the user interface, and the back-end is composed of, uh, let's say, of an array of web services. And if basically what you want to achieve is you want to receive, you want each end, the front and the back, to receive the tokens independently from one another. So that's why the hybrid flow is uh, specified. But as I said, um, we must attend to use the authorization call flag. So how, how does the actual uh, request look like? Basically, uh, we use the um, this is a special endpoint of the OpenID provider uh, where we do the redirection. That is where we send the browser to, and what we then do we attach a bunch of parameters. Um, the flow is specified. What kind of flow you want to get is specified by the so-called response type parameter. And when you give it the value of code, it, it, it triggers this particular flow. Uh, then we have this scope parameter. Uh, any idea what the scope does? All right. Um, in all uh, the, the intent of this parameter is to um, basically specify what kind of things you can do with the access token. That is, can you open this particular door, or which doors you can open. If you stick the keyword open ID into it, uh, you will also get uh, the other token that you want. So this is basically a signaling mechanism that says, please um, give me an ID token back. Uh, then you also have, need to specify the 
identifier for your application, which is some kind of a uh, string generated by the provider. Uh, you also pass a state parameter. Uh, this is used to um, allow um, you to link the request with the response. So when you get the response back into your application, you're able to relate uh, the, the two together. So you know where where the response is coming from because you having you could potentially be having hundreds or thousands of users, and you want to know once you send a request out for which particular user or session, um, the response is coming back. And the response will be sent to this particular uh, URL on the client side. Or, in other words, this is a, a URL where your application will be expecting the responses. Uh, and this is being just URL encoded here. So what happens next? Um, basically, um, the, the spec does not uh, say how the user gets authenticated. Uh, typically, what will happen at this point, um, the provider will pop up this window where you can enter your credentials. And then it may ask you for consent, do you want to log in with this particular application or not? And if you say, OK, I agree to all that, uh, then the provider, OpenID provider, will generate a response with the authorization code attached to it and the state parameters, so you can tie it back to the original request. And your application will then get involved with this particular URL. If, for some reason, um, the user denies the request, you will get back um, an access denied error. And the protocol specifies a number of other um, error calls, such as if you have your request wrong, uh, if the client is not registered, um, there's a whole array of possible um, error codes. But bear in mind that uh, the provider may not always uh, provide you with an error code if something goes wrong. So now that we have this uh, intermediary uh, code, what do we do with it? Uh, we make a second request, but this happens on the back channel, uh, to the OpenID provider. To exchange, fin to exchange finally uh, the code for the ID token. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to authenticate the application. And this happens uh, typically happens, there are various ways, but typically is done using a classic plant ID and secret uh, which you have obtained from, um, from the OpenID provider. And then you include the authorization code. This is basically a keyword which specifies what the exchange is. And here you need to uh, include again a copy of the original redirection URL that you used to uh, receive the code. And if all goes well, okay, <coughs> finally uh, we have our ID token back. So we then, what we then get is a JSON object uh, with the ID token appended. Uh, here I, I just basically truncated because it's a very long string. Uh, do you have any questions for this particular point about the, about the flows? Right. Um, but then you might wonder, okay, what, what is this thing, access token here? You know, then we want to get uh, an ID token back. And this is the expiration stuff and refresh token. Uh, these are basically artifacts from the underlying OAuth protocol. And uh, we'll talk about them uh, in a few minutes' time. Okay. So what, what else does OpenID Connect do, apart from uh, giving you access or providing with, with you with uh, ID tokens? Uh, there's also a very nice uh, JSON schema defined for standard uh, user attributes. That is information that you might want to use in your application in order to 
uh, create an account for the user. Uh, very often you would need access to the user's email address. Uh, you want to have access maybe to, to the user's name, uh, maybe phone number. And the nice thing is that you, you may also um, extend the, the schema with additional attributes that you might want to need. And how do you get at this stuff? Um, we basically specify uh, additional scope values into this project. So if you want to get uh, the user's email back, you next to the OpenID scope, you include this email key keyword. Uh, if you get if you want to get various profile information such as such as name, uh, you include this keyword. And then what would happen at the very end? You get this access token back. So what is the uh, access token? Um, I think the French word for it is jeton, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so it basically uh, gives you uh, access to various protected um, services. In the case of OpenID Connect, uh, you can use it to retrieve uh, this user info, which was previously uh, consented by the end user. Uh, the, the server may choose to uh, include additional uh, scope values, so you can get access to additional APIs if you need to. Uh, from the point of view of the client, this is just a pack string that you need to store. I mean, the client is not concerned with the content of the access token. So how, how to get the user info? Just make a get request to the user info endpoint of the OpenID provider and um, include the, the access token string in, in authorization uh, header. Um, why do we have this uh, bear keyword in there? Do you have any idea? This is a type of Sorry? This is a type of token? Yes, it, this is a token type which is bear. Now what does this mean? Uh, this means that whoever <laughs> Whoever has this card can get into my hotel room. Uh, and this is in contrast to the original um, OAuth 1 OAuth tokens, which for you in order to use them, uh, you have to apply a signature. Whereas in the case of the bearer tokens, which are, let's say, the most commonly used tokens, uh, well, you can actually argue about that. But basically, uh, the OAuth 2.0 uh, version of, of the specification um, does not prescribe what particular type the tokens are. However, OpenID Connect says that they are of type bear, which means that you have to keep your uh, token secure. Otherwise, if you lose it, somebody else will get uh, the user's details or other sensitive information. Which means that when you make this uh, get request, what do you have to do? Correct. Good. Uh, you have to use SSL, uh, HTTPS. So, what happens then? Uh, the server receives the access token, and if it's still valid, uh, it basically provides you with the uh, user details that the person has previously consented uh, to the application. Okay. Uh, let's see, do we, what, how much time do we have? Maybe we can do a simple, um, we can do a simple demonstration of, of this using the OpenID protocol.
Uh, does any one of you uh, use uh, Google to log in into websites? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Google is actually one of the the first large scale uh, providers that, that use OpenID Connect, and they have a very nice uh, playground for experimenting with uh, this stuff. So what we, hear, what we see here is um, uh, an open ID client that was uh, created purely for development purposes. And uh, you have this first panel where uh, you need to enter, basically in order to make a, a request to an open ID provider, you need to know uh, a bunch of parameters. Uh, as I mentioned, this endpoint where the browser gets redirected. Uh, you need to know the token endpoint where the code gets exchanged for an ID token and you need to know the user info endpoint. Uh, this JWK endpoint, this is basically a JSON object which provides you with a public key of the provider. So you can do what with it? You can verify the ID token if you need to. And then to make the actual call, uh, you need to know your client identifier uh, your current sequence and you need to have a redirection URL. And here you can choose between various uh, client authentication methods. So here what we say, okay, we'll use the code flow which is specified in the response type parameter and apart from uh, indicating that we want to get uh, an ID token back we also say that we want to have access to the user's email address and then we click on login now what happens now um, the application basically created a pop-up window in, in a separate browser window and we got redirected to the open the provider now what the provider displays at this point is, is entirely up to the actual implementation so here we just enter some credentials. Now let's see what the value will look like. Oh, miracle for what? <laughs> okay. So then we are presented with um, the so-called consent uh, screen. Now this is in a very this is done very technical here, technically here, but typically there will be a much nicer interface where uh, you're being asked, okay, do I allow this application access to my uh, email address? That's basically it. And we say, okay, uh, we allow access to it, to the email, um, but let's say we will not uh, allow access to the so-called email verified flag. Basically, uh, this, this is a boolean value which says, uh, is the email verified or not? And then we click, click on all price or login. Okay. Um, then in, inside this window, uh, we, we have gotten back to the uh, client application. So the client application has received an authorization code and a state which allowed it to um, link back to, to the original request. Uh, then the application makes a backend request to the token endpoint to exchange the code for these uh, bits here, which is the ID token and an access token. Uh, you may then optionally retrieve the public uh, RSA key of the provider in order to verify the ID token. And finally, once you um, decode it and verify the signature, you will get uh, you will get the, the the payload out of it. 
and the most important bit is the subject or the user identifier, which you use to uh, create a local account for the user or basically find out who, who the user is. And the, identi the identity is specified by the tuple of the uh, provider identifier, issue identifier, this URL here, and the subject identifier. You always have to use this tuple uh, because um, there might be situations where uh, the user IDs are not unique across servers. You should not rely on this assumption. And finally, we make a call to the user info endpoint to get uh, the claims that we requested back. I'm not sure where you can see that. So that's uh, uh, basically it. <coughs> okay. Now let's return back to our presentation. Do you have guys any questions about this flow that we that we have here? <coughs> yes, please. Yeah. J just a question about the scope. Is the scope is uh, um, for the the user for endpoint or for the token requests? Uh, the, the scope file. Yes, the, the, the first scope we, we ask. We can ask for email or something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We we get this on the user for endpoint or, or on the post of the token endpoint. Um. Or the actual information where, where it gets uh, encoded, uh, how, how you get gets it. Uh, if you use a code flow, the information will be returned at the user info endpoint. Okay. So it will not be included inside the uh, the ID token. However, uh, OpenID Connect has a special parameter, op but it, it is optional, which allows it to say, I don't want to. Uh, be getting this information from the user info endpoint, I want to have it encoded into the ID token. So you can do that as well if you want. You, you have this choice. Sure. So that was a good, good, good question. Okay, now let's go back to the original presentation. So uh, that's the idea. So um, I, I show you, I show, I show you the flows <laughs> and how things work. Uh, however, uh, if you're a developer and you're in a rush to develop uh, applications and you want to add open and connect to it, do not do this uh, as I just showed you. Uh, <laughs> basically. Um, uh, getting this entire process right is not that easy. So instead, uh, look uh, look for uh, libraries that pro can provide you with this very functionality. And if you're using Java, this is the thing, which Jerome will tell you about in the next uh, lecture. But of course, that, that does not mean that you should know what's happening uh, under under the hood. Okay. So now we basically uh, re summarize what we just covered. Uh, Open ID Connect has two uh, key artifacts. Number one, this is the uh, ID token, which asserts who the user is. And finally, we, we might have an access token as well to uh, get various user info stuff. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in, in, in uh, the very first uh, draft of the specification, the idea was to allow this uh, these information these information to be included in the ID token but there uh, there are problems with that. Um, do you have an idea why, why this could be a problem? Yeah number one is the size and number two which is also the size uh, if you if you're using the implicit flow and the token gets returned as part of the uh, URL uh, some browsers have this 2,000 characters limitation, I believe. Okay, some others. <laughs> okay, so briefly, what, what is the OpenID Connect framework? Uh, OpenID Connect uses OAuth 
to, as a protocol to get ID tokens. And the actual ID tokens are encoded as JSON web tokens. And the idea of OpenID Connect is to make clients as simple as possible and whenever there is complexity, uh, it is shifted to the server. Uh, if you have been, if, uh, if you look at the discussions on OpenID Connect uh, work group mailing list, very often whenever some decision has to be made, um, um, people look at solutions which keep clients as simple as possible and uh, huge complexity to the server. Because the identity providers and the people who program them are more likely to be paying attention to the important security stuff than expecting developers to, to know that. Okay, and this is again an overview of the uh, endpoints. Now, there are a few optional uh, endpoints. And let's see, do we still have them about them here? Okay. Uh, these endpoints are not um, mandatory. That means you can run a basic OpenID Connect provider with just these three above. But the spec also uh, has these uh, f f five, yeah, five uh, endpoints at the bottom. So what do they do? Um, Actually, I'll skip this one. <laughs> yeah. So what's, what's basically the idea of this uh, optional uh, endpoints? No, that's not there. Um, if, you, if you've been developing uh, client applications uh, and you want to facilitate third-party login, you know that you end up in a situation where, okay, you think, I want to uh, allow people login with third-party sites, so I'll put, let's say, I'll put a Facebook button, uh, up, but I also want to include Google, so you put a button for Google. Uh, but then there are people who use Twitter, so I'll put a button for Twitter as well. But, oh, come on, they, Microsoft has also got their own service. And the trouble with that is, first of all, you get um, a nasty interface, user interface, and you as a developer have, have we have to maintain a number of libraries for each of these providers. And this is not optimal. So what, what, what is the solution to that? Um, this, I don't think this is, this, this is any uh, conceptually a new stuff. But basically, by uh, including these options into the protocol, uh, the guys at OpenID uh, provide a mechanism where when you enter a website, you only need to enter your email address then some miracle will happen and the application will get your ID token. Um, do you have any, any idea how this could possibly work? Okay, I'll explain that. Now, uh, the first step is the so-called WebFinger pro uh, protocol. Uh, Any one of you who is familiar with the Unix finger command and what it does? Yes. What does it do? That's where you are. Well, it's not really an authentication system. Basically, this is a command which shows uh, who is currently on this computer. So if you type finger and provide the IP address or hostnet on your computer, it will show you that, let's say, oh, Vladimir and Charo are on this computer. So what finger does something similar, it basically um, provides information. If you have the email address, let's say, uh, of somebody, in, uh, you want to find out what their OpenID Connect provider is. So this is a protocol which, which uh, enables the discovery of the OpenID Connect provider for email address. But in order for that to happen, uh, the email provider has to support that. But it's not very hard to do because it's, it's simply a, it can be a static or dynamic JSON object which is returned and it's just a link to, to the provider. 
Okay. So once we have the provider, um, what do we do then? Uh, we might we need to get a cl uh, client registration on the provider. If you remember, we need to have this client ID and client secret. But how do we get them? I mean, if you've been developing apps and uh, if you've been doing sign up with Google or Facebook, what we typically do, you would open up, you would register, let's say, with Facebook, uh, then you would go to, to this development um, account, and Facebook will generate a client ID and client secret. Uh, what this protocol here does, it allows you to um, do this automatically via web API. But before you register, you might want to know a few parameters. That is, what are the endpoints of the provider? Because you cannot make requests without them. And these are advertised from this particular URI, which is called the Provider Configuration URI, which is typically a static document. So these optional uh, endpoints, what they basically facilitate is a process where uh, the user enters their email address, the next step is to find out what the OpenID provider is for that person. Uh, if your uh, application does not have uh, a registration with this particular provider, you can automatically register yourself without any user interaction and you having to go there and, and, and uh, do the same manually. And then you can make the um, authentication request and finally you will have this ID token. Uh, this this uh, this thing appears to be very nice because, uh, first of all, it would allow um, for a more democratic, how to say, um, identity provisioning. Because in that case, uh, you would be able, let's say, if you set up your own provider, uh, you'll be able to uh, log in um, without having to use a third-party service. Because whenever you use, let's say, Google or Facebook. Uh, uh, I don't I, I, I don't know whether privacy is concerned if you, if you or not, but uh, every time you use their service, you provide information about a particular site you're logging into. And this particular protocol and or flow uh, allows you to use any provider, including your own, with any application, provided the application supports that. Uh, the, the sad news is that nobody has, hasn't uh, implemented that yet. From end to end. So if you're looking for some, some nice project, uh, hopefully open source, this might be a good task to look at. Um, I don't know uh, what, what the chances for that are. Maybe it may never pick up. I don't know. I really don't know. Open Day Connect also has another option which is called self-issued provider, which is an even, um, I would say, a simpler form of authentication. Because if you think about it, yeah, why why do I have to use a third party service to say who I am? This is strange, isn't it? Can't you just say I'm Vladimir, you know, I'm Jerome, I'm Shah, can't you say that? You know? <laughs> so Open ID Connect also provides for that as well. But nobody is, is um, using that yet. Okay. Here I have provided a brief, no, actually it's a very comprehensive list of the uh, specifications. Uh, if you want to find more about OpenID Connect, just open up this document. And it will contain references to the, to the underpinning specs. Like what or what you always, how you work with these pair of tokens, and concerning the ID tokens, how they get encoded, and how you protect them with signatures or how you encrypt them and how you can obtain the RSA public keys from the server. Right, so that's basically it. Thank you.
use uh, the first to determine the, the finest uh, grounds on an application on your website. Um, you, your concern is how, how you manage the scopes. Yes, I'll, I'll use it to, to determine on the, the play on side uh, the, the, the specific grounds or specific uh, use, uh, use case. Or, Oh, you, you mean um, how you define what the scope does? Yes. Uh, this is entirely after the application. Okay. Now, typically, the server will. Uh, uh, you, you, you have a server which does authorization. Basically, it says, okay, it presents this um, window where it says, do you give access to these particular resources? And they are identified by keywords, these, these particular strings. But it is entirely up to you how you define them, what they do. Uh, they only matter in the context of the resource server, that is the web API. So let's say if you have an, a web API for keeping some kind of lists, you know, shopping lists, something like that, uh, you might have a scope value which is read, so you can read the list, and you can have another one which is write, which allows you to, to modify. Yeah. So, so the question uh, uh, came to me, um, with the authorization endpoint, yeah. when the client asks for, uh, for the authorization, yes. we have to, to pass all the scopes, OpenID, and uh, we may have to pass also the, the specific uh, scopes for the application. Uh, you will only need OpenID if you need to get an I token back. Okay. If you uh, miss open ID, uh, if you meet op open ID, you won't get uh, an ID token back, and the server will, the server will just work as a basic OAuth authorization server. Okay. So that's basically. Okay. But for the authorization, so when you you pass all the uh, the scopes you need, yes, I I believe uh, we determine the user scopes in the sub. Uh, in the Part of the part of the all the scopes of the client. So you can, with the uh, authorization with only open ID as a scope, mm -hmm. you can get all the scopes of the, with the user of the all the scopes for the specific user. No, mm -hmm. no. only a part of the. Just a, um, an intersection between yeah. the scopes you ask and the scopes you, you can use. Okay. So That's you want the ones that are defining your clients. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, I, I had a, a question. Uh, you said that we can use only uh, authorization code in implicit flows. We cannot use um, so client credentials, for, uh, for instance, with OpenID Connect. Can we use the client credentials flow in uh, OpenID Connect? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, you cannot use that because uh, there is no user sitting there. Yeah. But yeah. In fact, my question is when there is a chain of calls, imagine the first call uh, is made by a web app which uses uh, yes. authorization code, and then in the chain there is one service that uses client credentials. That means this service cannot retrieve the info of the user that's initiated the, uh, the code? Um, now, if the, uh, the, the client credential, if I understand you correctly, the client credentials grant is intended for situations where the, the application acts on, on its own behalf. That is, uh, it is not the application working or doing things on behalf of me or you. Um, in fact, so my question, if I have one web application which uses uh, authorization code, yeah. but my web application uh, calls one services, one other services, I don't mm -hmm. know what, which one, yes. and this service calls also another services. Mm -hmm. So there's a chain? Yeah, there is a chain. Okay. And if uh, I'm the, the last one, uh, the last service, I want to know uh, which user initiated the, the chain. Mm -hmm. Is there mm -hmm. a way to do it? To it's, yeah, but it's not the, the same access token between all the requests. Mm -hmm. You have to use the same token ID. You get the token ID when you start the chain. Yeah. You pass the token ID 
and you should not mm -hmm. do this with all, uh, all two because it's not the same clients each time. Okay, each time I, I, should, uh, I, 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 I got okay. it. Um, now, if you want to uh, cast to to pass the the ID token further back into the backend, you know, you, you have to include it as some kind of a parameter outside the the the, the regular protocol interaction. Okay. If, if, if you want to pass this knowledge further back, this is not really standardized. I mean, this no, it's not. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. I didn't find any solution. Yeah. You have to do deal with this at the application level. That is how you define your particular application to work. Okay. Yes. Uh, can you pass some context to the uh, to uh, the identity provider, like uh, the email address? I know who the user is. I want to say to the identity provider, please uh, authenticate the uh, this user. I, I I know it's Alice at Wonderland.net. Mm -hmm. I want to authenticate. Is it possible to to send some context in the authentication request? Uh, additional information. Yes. Um, I'm not talking about the score. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. About oh. an email address, some uh, internal I think, ID, I think, yeah. some other open label field. Okay, can the question. For a, a wire transfer, we need for I don't know the amount mm -hmm. for the wire transfer, something like that. Uh, why why do you want to do that? <laughs> Imagine we have a website, we have, yes. an access, uh, we have an active session, and we want to ensure that the user is still active on the server or something like that. We know it's uh, LS, and we want to check that it's, uh, she's still uh, here. And she. Imagine we have a banking account. Mm -hmm. We authenticate for the first time, we have access to the account. Okay, when we want to, the, to do a uh, Wire transfer. We want to ensure that it's still Alice that wants to the wants to do the, the uh, wire transfer. We okay. want to send some context to ensure that it's some user. Ah. Uh, some. ID okay. Some yeah. You want like to that. check whether this is the session is still. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In order to do that. To uh, first authentication level. Yeah. Or to step up the authentication. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, there are parameters for that. I mean, basically. Uh, uh, include an additional parameter which says I want uh, the authentication to happen on this particular level and if the current session is not at this level uh, the server will respond and let's say ask for some additional confirmation yeah, this, this is, can be done but it, can, it will only work if, if the provider supports this okay, so, so you have to there is no standard, standard. Uh, there is a standard which which, um, which which sets out the rules how to request this, okay. but uh, there is no standard which says every open ID uh, connect provider should do that. It's not one that Yeah, and and how 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 the actual user should be authenticated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, you talked about uh, some uh, privacy concerns. Mm -hmm. if you use, uh, for example, Facebook or Google to even sign on across different websites. Yes. But also, uh, isn't there a private, um, security concern because uh, this Google or Facebook yes. they know on which website you use it yes. to Definitely. sign on? So they can impersonate you and uh, say, lo log into the site and say, hey, I am Vladimir. Here is the valid token, and yeah. so they can connect as you. Yeah, they can do that. <laughs> yes. Uh, if if you uh, this uh, interaction only works on the premise that you trust the identity provider. Yes. So, are there any identity providers that we can reuse and install and uh, to run your own? Um, for Java, there is a project which is called Miter ID. And um, this, this is this is run by a guy who's also on the OpenID Connect working group. So I suggest to check this this one out. It's open source software. I think there should be others for I think PHP etc. But I'm only familiar with this one in, in Java. So are you saying that there are only one private identity provider that you can use? 
Sorry? If we don't want to use Google and uh, the other... If, okay, if, 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 yeah. yeah, if you, want, if you don't want, want to use Google, um, you can set up your own. You can uh, set up your own. But this is, this is actually not the main problem. The main problem right now is that uh, the actual uh, application developers, they still use this, um, this approach where they put, let's say, buttons for Google and Facebook and they uh, in hardwire uh, libraries which are specifically designed to log in people with, with, with this particular provider. So even if you have your own provider, you, uh, this still doesn't allow you to, um, to log in into any website that supports, that supports OpenID Connect if it doesn't have this uh, discovery features implemented. And I'm not aware of any website that actually does that yet. Yeah. What about native uh, application? Uh, today uh, I'm not sure I do right, but mm -hmm. I open a web view with uh, an OS2 uh, implicit flow and my native apps know her uh, client ID and her uh, client secrets. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there something new with OpenID Connect about native application? Um, there was. Yeah. Do have uh, th there was uh, an effort to create, let's say, a more fluent and seamless experience on mobile devices uh, by specifying something like an extension to the protocol, uh, which is specifically for, for, for that. But uh, nowadays the situation is such that um, typically um, you, you would, re you would uh, rely on the browser to do that. So. Um, you would either use WebView or if you want to do uh, single sign-on, that is keep this capability of just logging in once, not having to get your credentials, uh, you would rely on the, on the system browser for that. Is that...? Yes, and uh, uh, is it good to have the client secret in the apps? Um, this is all right. The, the only problem is... Um, Okay, uh, the only problem is, um, is this client secret and ID set for all, uh, up, let's say, uh, applications which are downloaded from the, from the store or not? Uh, there, is, um, um, there is a spec which allows you to <coughs> distribute applications from the store without a client ID and client secret. Uh, but once the user installs them, they will make a registration request to the provider and they will be able to obtain these details. But this is, I don't think this is, this is being supported yet. But I think this is the direction where things are, are heading. Because this can be a common problem, you know, having to include credentials in the, in the, in the, in the application. Oh, another question. Uh, it's, it's not a question, it's just to comment. To comment, yeah. Uh, you said that the, when you use the implicit flow, yes. uh, the client is not authenticated. No. This is because when you use a, a public client, like a JavaScript application or mobile application, they, there is no sec uh, client secret. So the authorization server or the OpenID provider should not give you a client secret when you use a public cli uh, client. Yeah, yeah, this should not happen. But I mean, some people still do that. Yeah. But but it's in the case of the implicit flow. Basically, the way the, the exchange is designed, you cannot have a secret there because you can still pass a kind of secret, but it's not really a secret because because it's known by the user. So it's not something that is secret. Okay. Well. Thank you, guys. Oh. Well, that's fine. We've got a fantastic silent solution. It has a specification for a single logout. <laughs> the use case being, uh, yeah. I, I'm in a single cafe, I use my, uh, my uh, OpenID Connect identity to log into a few websites. Yeah. And I want to single log out before I leave. Okay, now uh, there is no uh, final spec on that yet. Actually, um, 
But uh, when I say final, I mean like a final contest, but it's been worked on. And even as we speak right now, uh, currently there are four different, let's say, uh, specifications being uh, discussed for logout. One is uh, provider initiated logout, that is, you go to your provider and say, I want to log out. And you log out, you log out of, from all your uh, <coughs> applications where you've logged in, or you can choose from which one. And the other one is the so called um, resign party, which is just the, the term for the client, client initiated logout. So let's say you are inside your application and you want to log out, which will then redirect you back to the uh, provider where you can continue the process. And from these two, uh, let's say, ways of initiating logouts, there are then two variants. Uh, the, one, <laughs> the one is the so-called front channel and back channel, basically doing this via a front and back channel. But this is not finalized yet. And if we're lucky, and depends on, on it also depends on, on uh, user feedback. <coughs> a lot of this, um, uh, let's say protocols are first um, drafted inside the work group. People come up with suggestions, but uh, I also try to uh, talk to developers and customers, which we have what, about their opinion, feedback, how, how this should be happening. Because user input is is important. I mean, when we're devising these protocols, we're doing that for you guys. Yeah. Good. 